Hi there! Welcome to the 24 episode of the Synth project where we are going to build a synth together. With all the modules to build so far, we have a synthesizer that is already able to play sounds and melodies, and also to add some color to the tones by modulating both in frequency and in amplitude the notes that are generated. But we still need two more modules to expand to the max the base capability of the instrument, and they are the envelope generator and the voltage control filter, or VCF. Today we will begin to explore the first of these modules, and we will learn together what an envelope is, what kind of effect it produces on the sound, and how we can create a synth module that does that. Before we dive into this subject, please take a moment to subscribe and to click on the bell to activate the notifications, if you haven't done so already, and this way you will not miss any of the future episodes of this series. And now, let's begin! Let's start by looking at the shape of the notes generated by a piano. I retrieved the shape using my laptop and Audacity, a great sound editing and analyzer tool that is available for free on Windows, Linux and Mac. If you like to try retrieving the shapes by yourself, just bring your laptop close to the piano, then start recording with Audacity through the laptop microphone and play some notes. Besides the piano, you can use for this experiment any other instruments that generate like a percussion sound. Let's now take a close look at the shapes produced by Audacity. The graphical images on Audacity represent the sound waves from an audio file. The amplitude is proportional to the volume, and if you zoom into the picture just enough, you can see the details of the sound wave itself. There are two channels visible in the diagram because I captured the recording in stereo. For our purposes, we will concentrate on the upper diagram, which is the left channel. The right channel behaves the same way from the perspective of our analysis. You may also notice that there are two colors in the picture. The darker one is the actual shape of the wave instant by instant. The lighter color represents the RMS value of the sound in that instant, which is a sort of average of all the sine wave components present in that instant in the sound. The contour of the lighter area is what we call the envelope of the sound wave, and that is the part we are interested in for our particular analysis. Looking at this picture, you can see that every time a piano key is pressed, a burst of sound is generated, and it looks like it started with a high volume and then decreased until it disappeared. But this is not what really happened. The problem is that this picture does not have enough resolution on the horizontal axis, which is the time. So let me zoom in a little bit, and you will see what's going on really. Look, at the moment the key is pressed, the amplitude is very low, practically zero, but then it starts increasing until it reaches a maximum. The time it takes to go from zero to the max value is called attack, usually abbreviated with the letter A. We can represent the attack interval on a diagram like this. Now let's zoom out again, but not much. See how the signal goes down exponentially until it reaches a point where it does not decrease anymore for a little while? The time it takes to decrease from the maximum value to this constant value is called decay time, and it is usually represented with the letter D. Here is the graphical representation along with the attack. And now, there is this part where the signal keeps almost the same amplitude for a certain amount of time. This interval can last a variable amount of time, it all depends on how long we keep the piano key pressed. The constant amplitude in the whole interval is called sustain, usually abbreviated with a letter S, for which here is its graphical representation. After this interval, the signal starts decreasing again, and this is in fact the moment when we release the key, and therefore the sound stops. But it doesn't stop instantly, you see, it takes a certain amount of time to do it. This interval is called release time, because it is related to the release of the key. This interval is also usually identified with the letter R, and here is its graphical representation, along with all the previous ones. 
And so, the sound of a single piano key is actually made of four different sections, which we can identify as A, D, S and R, or attack, decay, sustain and release. Now, so far, our synth is not capable of doing such a thing, because it is an electronic instrument, not a mechanical one like the piano. Well, the piano I use is electronic also, but it emulates the real piano, so basically that's what we are talking about. However, we can build a device that can simulate the behavior of a mechanical instrument to make the sound look more like a natural one rather than an electronic one. Such a device is called an envelope generator, or an ADSR generator, which reminds of the four intervals we have discovered through Audacity. The interesting thing is that all the instruments have this kind of behavior. Each one emphasizes some aspect of the envelope, other instruments emphasize other aspects. So, some instrument may have a shorter attack than others, while another instrument may not have a sustain at all, like a drum, for example. Let's now go back to Audacity and continue our analysis. In this region, I hit continuously the same key at a fast pace. See, in this case, the amplitude did not have the chance to go to zero before the next attack took place, and so the sound remained there for a long period of time with continuous peaks due to the repetition of the key. And basically, what it would have been a sequence of attack, decay, sustain and release was interrupted by the beginning of the attack of another key, we call this re-triggering. Remember the trigger output on the keyboard controller? We can use that on an envelope generator to simulate the same effect we see with the piano. And of course, if we keep hitting the key at a slower pace, the ADSR cycle will be interrupted later, and we will see a behavior like the one in this section of the diagram. But again, whatever we do with the synth keyboard, Thanks to the usage of the trigger, we can replicate these shapes at will, making the synth sound closer to the behavior of a traditional instrument. And the beauty of all of that is that we can make an ADSR module where we can control the attack, decay, sustain and release all independent from each other. And this way we can recreate envelopes for any kind of instrument and even create shapes that don't exist in nature. So, uh, let's start talking about how to make an ADSR and what kind of characteristics it should have to work as a good envelope generator. First, it will need to be able to adjust at will three time parameters, the attack, the decay and the release, and one amplitude parameter, which is the sustain. And since we are there, we could also have a fifth control to adjust the overall level of the control signal, a sort of volume, if you will. We could call this control peak to indicate that it will be able to adjust actually the peak level of the attack and therefore everything else after that. Next, we need to identify when to begin an attack interval and how long the sustained interval should last. For that, we will use the gate and the trigger signals. To explain how that would work, let's refer to this picture, which I borrowed from the datasheet of the component we will be using to create the envelope generator. So, we can definitely use the trigger signal to figure out when to initiate the attack interval. When there is no output signal, like at the beginning of this diagram, the trigger is the one that will initiate the attack sequence, which will go on until it completes. However, if another trigger is fired because another key is pressed, whatever the output signal was doing, it will stop it, right there, and will initiate a new attack sequence starting from the level it had at that very point. This will allow to reproduce the case where I was continuously hitting the keyboard key, and the signal didn't have the chance to entirely go to zero. Let's now take a look at the gate signal. The gate signal generated by the keyboard controller is going to start at the same time as the first trigger, and we really don't care about it because we know already that kind of information for the beginning of the attack sequence. But we can use the end of the gate signal to figure out when to initiate the release sequence, like in this point. Whenever several keys are pushed in fast succession, we will have separate triggers for each one of them, but the gate signal will persist until the last key is released. 
and only when the last key is released, the gate signal will go away, and that will tell the envelope generator to terminate the sustain sequence and initiate the release sequence. All of this tells us that the envelope generator module will need two inputs, the trigger and the gate, and we will have one output, which is the control voltage replicating the shape of the envelope. It will also need five controls, the one for the attack, the one for the decay, the one for the sustain, the one for the release, and finally the volume control that we indicated with the name PEAK. A pretty full panel, actually. And here is the drawing of how I am thinking to make it. The five potentiometers for the adjustments of the ADSR intervals and the peak will be in a vertical row, followed by two jack sockets for the control voltage output. They will provide exactly the same output. I just put two of them because in some instances we may want to use the same envelope to do multiple things at the same time. But then there are four more jack sockets. Two are those we have talked about, the gate and the trigger inputs. But there are two more, which I call the gate through and trigger through, which are actually outputs. These extra jacks are actually outputs replicating the same trigger and gate inputs. I added them here because it is very common to use the same gate and trigger signals to control multiple modules at once, and adding through connectors for these signals on each of the modules who use them simplifies patching the synth. I'm also debating whether to put two generators on the same module side by side to have an extra one available without adding a whole other module to the synth pack. I will make the final decision later and I would like to know your thoughts about that. Please make your suggestions in the comments below. Thank you. In the meantime, to avoid making this a long and boring video, I will end our discussion right here and we will start talking about the design of the module in the next episode. So, see you soon, and as usual, happy experiments!